In November 2000, Samuel Harris went to state prison, sentenced to 60 years, some of that time he had already served while awaiting trial. And I was originally sentenced on the robbery, the abduction, the carjacking, the gun charges. It was for a crime committed the year before, in November 1999, in Suffolk. And on the day of November the 30th, I was walking around, and I got to a house. I just actually I rang the doorbell, and nobody was there. And that's when I went around the back and went through the back door and broke into the house. And that's when I started taking some firearms out the house. In the midst of this, the couple comes home. Harris says he directed the man to get on the floor and the woman to hand over her car keys. Those instructions would later mean abduction and carjacking charges, although he says he told the couple he didn't intend to hurt anyone. I got in the car and I left in a high-speed chase and sued after that, which I eventually pulled over and surrendered to the police. Later was arrested and taken back to the jail. But the whole time I knew, I even told my lawyers, I'm not going to try to fight this because I was, I mean, I was guilty as what I did. I was guilty, you know. You remember this picture? Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> Samuel Harris's family wants the world to meet a very different man than the one who went on a breaking and entering spree in 1999, a man they adore to this day. Samuel Harris is my cousin. Him and I, we're two months apart from kindergarten to the fifth grade. We were in the same class. Him and I have been inseparable all our lives. Samuel Harris is my baby brother. He's always been mischievous but always very curious. And, but he was just as sweet as he could be. When he joined the Army, oh my God, he, he, he loved it. And I can remember him um, coming to my house and, you know, he, he was just excited. Of course, adulthood changes things somewhat, you know, as we get older, but our hearts never separated. I was raised by my mom and dad, and he's a pastor. And I had the only two-parent household on my block. We were the house all the kids hung out in. So I graduated high school. I was, you know, I guess I was a good kid. They always say they saw the potential of me and what I could do. Harris says that given his love for sports, he considered a career as an agent. But ultimately, he followed the lead of his stepfather. He was a Vietnam vet. I remember he used to have this picture on the wall. He was a prior trooper by the 82nd and a cousin had served as well. Alfonso, Sam looked up to him. He respected him. And listening to stories of their experiences drew him to serve in the military. And he's always admired our stepdad. His name for him was Big Dave, my Dave. So he decides to follow in the footsteps of his stepdad and his cousin. It was 1987 when Harris began his military career with plans to serve for two decades and then retire comfortably. But just a few years later, he was back in Suffolk and behaving like a different person. There was an incident where I had just bought a brand new car and I let him drive it and he totaled it. He wrapped it around a telephone pole. We had to rush to Norfolk General um, and he, it was, it was terrible. But he would always say, I hate alcohol. And to find out that, you know, alcohol had played a part in it. And that was, you know, it was, it was scary. We began to see the downward spiral in his life, you know, and it went from the alcohol to drugs and doing anything and everything he, you know, to support his habit. So, yeah, he, he was not the same. Sister Tracy remembers him knocking on her door in the middle of the night in the dead of winter. And I had told him, I said, you can't stay here. I said, because I don't want to wake up and all my stuff is gone. You know, so that was the hardest thing to do, to turn him down. And when he left, I got on the phone and I called my dad and I was crying. And I was like, Dad, I was like, please find him. Please get him somewhere to uh, stay. It is so cold. I said, but I can't let him stay here. About maybe a month or so before the incident happened that led him to prison, he came over to my house. I hardly recognized him, you know, the person that was standing at the door. I remember asking him, have you eaten? And do you need to go somewhere or anything? And he said, no. He said, I'm, I'm fine. And I knew he wanted to, you know, I didn't know what to say to him and, you know, to reach him. And, and he didn't know what to say to me, but he was, he was screaming for help. He was, he wanted help. One of the questions that I get a lot now is, it bothers me, but I understand when people tell me now, you don't look like a crack addict. And my question is, how does a crack addict look? And what made me become the crack addict? What was the catalyst for me going there? 
what led Harris to drugs and prison, what leads many veterans along this same path, is the focal point of the Operation Phoenix Veterans Group at Lawrenceville Correctional Center. My name is Casey Hall. I served from 94 to 98. Now that PTSD is becoming something major, the resources are slow to reach us from this side of the fence. We can't get up and go to the VA. So with Operation Phoenix, we can start to address some of those issues that more than likely led us to where we are today. Tim Miller, I was in the U.S. Navy from 1982 to 1989. I'm old enough to remember Vietnam, and those people had no idea what PTSD was back then. We're becoming alcoholics and drug users. We're doing the same things now. We're reverting back to self-medicating with drugs and alcohol. Yeah, we've got a diagnosis, but we don't have the support to deal with it. From the time we hit basic to the time that we leave, we are trained how to react, to engage. Nobody ever told me how to turn it off, that everywhere I go was not a war zone, that everybody was not my enemy. You see the PTSD, and most likely you're going to see a substance use disorder come in behind it, then you're going to see a crime. So it's like a pattern. The great part is learning how to talk about it. Talk about, you know, why are we came here? What are we, what are we struggling with? But I think for years, we were suffering in silence for so long, what do we do with it? Harris says for him, the trouble started in August 1988 when he nearly drowned at the bottom of a swimming pool during an Army training exercise. That was very scary. He was unresponsive, and they had told me to prepare my parents to fly to Alaska to be with him. But thank God, you know, he pulled through, and after a few weeks in the hospital, they flew him home. Got through that okay. Um, let me be honest, I refused to get help because back then, you know, it's like a stigma to go and see a psychologist or something. So I ended up getting out of the Army a year later. For his first few years back in Suffolk, Harris became one of the most successful car salesmen in the area. But increasingly, he turned to drugs for his unaddressed mental health issues. He says it was 2014 when VA representatives came to him in prison and 2015 when he was finally diagnosed with PTSD, stemming from that training accident in 1988. I'm not trying to absolve or make excuses for committing the crime, but... Part of the ingredients of committing these crimes is these undiagnosed mental health problems or issues that were never diagnosed or never diagnosed properly. You have to say played a part into you know, to, to leaving us here. So we're hoping this is a model for other prisoners. And I commend the counselors and the wardens for what they're doing. Harris says better support is needed as service members are making the initial transition to civilian life. He adds that behind the prison walls, there are veterans who are suffering coping with how their military service changed them and hoping that the country that they chose to serve won't forget them will consider the full extent of what they have sacrificed. Thank you for watching. Continue to follow Virginia news and stories by subscribing to our VPM YouTube channel.